Hi, I'm attorney Ramsey Barawi, and this is Your Money, Your Life. Today our topic is brain health and nutrition. Assisting me in this discussion is Dr. Nancy Emerson Lombardo, the president and founder of Brain Health and Wellness Center. She's also an adjunct research assistant professor of neurology at Boston University School of Medicine, as well as an investigator with the Boston University Alzheimer's Disease Center. Over the last 25 years, Dr. Emerson Lombardo has committed herself to healthy living for a healthy brain. In addition, over the past 10 years, Dr. Emerson Lombardo has developed lifestyle interventions for both the treatment and prevention of Alzheimer's disease, as well as improving the quality of life of older adults. And in addition, Dr. Emerson Lombardo has written numerous articles for publications such as Today's Dietitian, Today's Geriatric Medicine, the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, and the Journal of Nutrition. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Emerson Lombardo is considered a thought leader in Alzheimer's research and practice. Dr. Emerson Lombardo, welcome to Your Money, Your Life. It's great to have you here. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Now, you know, I went on one of your websites and I saw your biography, and that biography indicated you have a degree from Yale, you have a degree from Cornell, and those degrees are in government and in political science. Aha, uh -huh. you're one of the few that knows. <laughs> How on earth did you get into <laughs> brain health? Oh, that's, uh, well, it's easy. It was a segue. My mother developed Alzheimer's at an early age for her. She was in her early 50s. I was a young lass, let's put it that way. Okay through a lucky, lucky series of coincidences in my life. The moment I'm finishing my doctorate, um, I had moved uh, next door a couple of years earlier to a gentleman named Jerome Stone. Anyway, long story short, we became friends, neighbors and friends, and two years later, just as the time I'm finishing my doctorate, he gets asked to be the founding president of the National Alzheimer's Association, so he immediately and I had just done some leadership roles in my local community, that was Glencoe, Illinois, Chicagoland, and he asked me would I consider helping found the Chicago chapter mm -hmm. and with, with this wonderful woman who was a social worker. So we teamed up, we did that, I, and I was asked to join the national board, which was brand new at the time. And then I, soon after that, um, after we got Chicago started, my then husband um, got a new job offer in Detroit. So I moved to Detroit with another woman, founded that chapter. And so my initial work was with helping people like our, myself, family caregivers. And at that time, patients were usually diagnosed when they were quite far into the illness, mm -hmm. very unlike today. Though my mom, she, um, she resisted a diagnosis, so she didn't get it as early as she could have because she was resisting it. Um, she was afraid. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are afraid when their mind isn't working well. I spent, um, gosh, many years as a full-time volunteer for the Alzheimer's Association while I'm raising my children. Mm -hmm. And then I was asked uh, to join um, Hebrew Re Rehab Center for Aged when I moved to Boston, because I've been in Chicago, then Detroit. When I moved to Boston, by then I'd gotten acquainted with researchers all over the country. But while I started initially, doing studies on policy, like uh, I published a, um, a, um, a small piece on how do we improve mental health care of nursing home residents. That, that encompasses much bigger issues than Alzheimer's and dementia. But then after doing policy studies, just by, again, connections because of my work with the association, I was asked if I would lead up a study on dance movement therapy, mm -hmm. working with the American Dance Movie, uh, Movement Therapy Association to see if it would help people with dementia. Back in the early 90s, we didn't know the answer to that question. In fact, people thought, oh, if somebody has Alzheimer's, they can't s pay attention for 45 minutes to benefit from the therapy. What we saw was, number one, people could be fully engaged in this wonderful therapy, whether they had dementia or not, and um, seemed to benefit from it. The main benefit was reducing their level of anxiety mm -hmm. and stress. And that's really dramatic because a lot of people have that issue when they, they have Alzheimer's. And from there, then I moved my research to Wellesley and I got a chance to do a study on acupuncture. 
That's very far from public policy, there, right? There's a long ways. How did that happen? Well, because I, I love working with patients. I uh -huh. fell in love with that. And I'd done all these caregiver studies, but I discovered my true love was trying to make better, uh, better, things better for people who had the illness. And then, um, so I got this chance to study acupuncture. Mm -hmm. Got a grant, I wrote a proposal and got funded immediately from the Helen Bader Foundation. It was pure luck. Turns out people on that board loved acupuncture. Okay. It's a small board and okay. they really, uh, Wisconsin's one of the few states that use acupuncture to treat um, addiction. The other's Florida. And so the, the project in which you were involved, was it studying uh, acupuncture and, and dementia or acupuncture? Acupuncture and, and dementia. And, and, and again, what conclusion did you come to? What we came, the uh, conclusion, first of all, the patients were perfectly safe in the acupuncturist's office. Mm -hmm. They enjoyed their treatment. Mm -hmm. Nobody quit. Mm -hmm. So that was the first finding. It's feasible. And the second was, again, it relieved anxiety and stress. Okay. Depression, it depends on how you measured it. Some measures showed that it also relieved depression. The other thing, it improved vitality and energy. Mm -hmm. In a certain way, we measure that. Um, so that was very uh, positive. By now I'm hooked working with patients. And I had started gathering, uh, I always work with colleagues, I mm -hmm. never work alone. Acupuncture is part of Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. All right, another part of the story is about this time, I met um, a Chinese woman, she was a physicist in China. And she came to this country and actually here learned, uh, she was a physics professor at Beijing University. Her husband was ill, so she learned Qigong here and started using Qigong with herself and him because they were getting older. And what a great benefit to both of them. So she, we met and kind of just sparked, you know, just a, for, a close friendship form. She couldn't speak English, I couldn't speak Chinese, but I had a Chinese graduate student named mm -hmm. Bei Wu, who's now a full professor um, of gerontology at, at Duke. She's a brilliant woman. and. Uh, Shu Wen, the, the older woman, she called the three of us together because she knew I was interested in Alzheimer's. She laid out a whole program in order to help reduce the risk of Alzheimer's and to help people who have it, this is what you need to do. I can't tell you her sources, but they were in Chinese. Mm -hmm. You gotta eat the right foods, you gotta physically exercise, and you gotta keep your chi in balance. Mm -hmm. You also need to reduce stress and keep your mind active. I mean. She laid it out. Okay. Now so then, can can we talk about those those yeah. particular and items? Yeah. I, and I uh, checked this out with at that point in research, we we're just learning that chronic diseases like heart disease and diabetes increase your risk of getting Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. There, how do we help prevent those diseases and treat them? Lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So I looked at the literature, and she was right. There was just the beginnings. This is back in. Uh, Mm, the in the middle middle 1990s mm -hmm. yes lifestyle looked like it had some promise so I started exploring the literature and uh, there's a lot of evidence for phys suggestion that physical exercise might help and um, again stress reduction nutrition but at the time there was just suggestion based on what we call epidemiological or circumstantial, I call them circumstantial evidence. Mm -hmm. Interview a bunch of people, see what they're doing, what they're eating, whether they're exercising, whatever. Five years, 10 years later, you interview them again, see what diseases are starting to develop, and mm -hmm. then you, you link the two together. But is it total proof? No, it's a suggestion. Sure. Now, where let's fast forward to where we are now we have mountains of studies mm -hmm. and they're all pointing to lifestyles where it's at if you want to re reduce your risk of whether it's heart disease diabetes arthritis you name any diseases of the elderly but also brain diseases especially alzheimer's okay so let's talk a little bit about nutrition yeah now we're everybody's today looking for uh any advice they can get from it about right. nutrition right any store that you go to today, you will see prominently on the label, you know, this this particular product contains this or contains that. Uh, I mean, obviously, everybody's very, very concerned about nutrition. Right. If someone who has been eating, uh, let's call it a normal diet, normal American diet. They're in trouble. 
They may be in trouble, but what first step do they take to try to get their diet under control and eat okay. more nutritiously? Okay. The first thing is, in a way, think about how your grandmother or grandfather ate, or maybe if you're really young, your great-grandparents who mm -hmm. you didn't maybe know. Mm -hmm. And what did they eat? They didn't eat all the packaged and processed foods that we do today. Mm -hmm. We're starting to understand why that's been harmful for us. And why is that? Um, why, why are these packaged well, processed foods harmful? Well, first of all, 75% of them have added sugar. Mm -hmm. And I'll get into why sugar is one of the toxic foods we need to cut, really ramp down on. Okay. But, so sugar um, is bad. Sugar is, now having a little sugar, like in a whole food, in, in whole fruits, mm -hmm. root vegetables and nuts and seeds, that's how our ancestors got it. That amount of sugar is the right amount. Okay, and the so amount we're having now is 50 times that amount. So the fructose that, that you get from fruit is okay? Well, in, in, in modest amounts. In you could have, okay. again, five pieces, the equivalent of five pieces of fruit a day and be just fine, probably even seven pieces. Okay. But if you drank seven glasses of fruit juice, mm -hmm. that would be too much sugar. Okay, now may, let me pose the question a, another way. Let's say you have someone who's very conscious about what he or she ought to be eating, right. and they go out and they, they go to the supermarket and they find this, this fruit product, right. which has been prepared. It's, it's, not, it's not raw fruit. Okay. They bring it home, mm -hmm. and they look at the back of the package, and they find that there's 25 grams of sugar in there. Mm -hmm. In other words, they've added sugar to it. Bad, well, good. Well, un unfortunately, the way the nutrition facts are today, it just tells you the total amount of sugar. Mm -hmm. Doesn't tell you whether it's added or natural. Okay. You could have the same amount of uh, sugar in a big glass of fruit juice as you do this fruit cocktail that is like 70, 75 percent high fructose corn syrup. Might right. be the same amount of sugar, right. but it's different sugars. One is added and one is not. Now. Um, so you need to look at the ingredients part. You look at nutrition facts is the, mm -hmm. the top, mm -hmm. the bottom is the ingredients, and you just learn to see all the sugar that's, you can, that's where you see if it was added. I see, I see. Right, and if it says cocktail, you know it was added. Okay. All right. All right. And well, that's important to know. Yeah, and yeah. one reason you, if, if it's the same amount of sugar, why do you care? Well, when it's in the natural fruit, it's loaded with nutrients. Mm -hmm antioxidants that help protect your brain and your body mm -hmm. and help counterbalance to a little bit some of that sugar you're getting. So it's all about balance because if you got lots of antioxidants, you take a whole, this is why eating your fruit whole is a little safer mm -hmm. because in that whole apple, you've got all the skin and the fiber mm -hmm. inside, even if you peeled it, though mm -hmm. I wish you wouldn't. <laughs> you don't eat the seeds, okay. <laughs> but you got a lot of fiber and other great things beyond the juice, right. and that slows down the absorption of the sugar. Also, it's not as intensely sweet because you haven't concentrated the juice. Once you concentrate the juice, you probably shouldn't have more than a glass, glass at most two a day. I see, I see. And um, what happens is, even though you've got all those wonderful nutrients in the apple, especially if it's squeezed with the peel, which it usually is, mm -hmm. you're getting really concentrated nutrition. But when you have like a lot of it, you're getting too much total sugar. Okay. Um, and uh, the good thing about apples is it has a neurotransmitter that helps the memory. Is that <laughs> Acetylcholine, right? Acetylcholine, the same okay. one they try to all increase right. with the Alzheimer drugs. Now let's talk about some of the other um, foods that are out there that are being touted. One of them is blueberries, mm -hmm. strawberries. Mm -hmm. People are talking about strawberries. Sure. People are talking about salmon, fish. Uh -huh. are, are those brain healthy foods? Yes, and, they and all are. And if so, are. how so? Also, uh, they all are both uh, brain healthy. Okay, now the berries is part of the fruit family. Mm -hmm. And why we recommend berries, if you're gonna choose which fruit to eat, besides an apple, mm -hmm. An apple a day probably does help keep the doctor okay. away, or even for the brain. We're learning it's got miracles in it. But berries are small, so a small surface area, so they're more nutrient-dense foods. Mm -hmm. So th for the little amount of sugar in them, with that delicious flavor that most berry, if they're you know mm -hmm. good berry, you're getting really powerful nutrition. 
Mm -hmm. And it's so powerful that they're considered anti-inflammatory fruits. Mm -hmm. And then if um, they've also been shown by one of our um, Boston researchers to be, uh, um, they help the brain signal that cells talk to each other. Mm -hmm. If he had looked at every fruit, maybe he would have found other fruits as well, but the berries are really stand out. So if you're choosing what fruit, go for the berries, any berry. They each bring something to the table, each color mm -hmm. of the different berries, different antioxidants. Blueberries are a star, but so are the rest. Okay, now, so that, that's in the berry family. Uh, before we move on to salmon and fish, I tell people, while we say eat your fruits and vegetables, it really should be eat your vegetables and fruit, mm -hmm. because it's vegetables that will save your brain. I not see. the fruit. I see. The fruit is good, mm -hmm. but it's got, like if you eat too much of it, you got sugar. And a lot of people have trouble eating their vegetables. They don't like them, and they haven't figured out, you know, they're just not stars in their mind because in this society, we're, we're learning to want everything to taste sweet. Mm -hmm. Fruit is naturally sweet. Many vegetables, except for like um, sweet potatoes, which I do recommend, are, are not sweet. Now, if you get more sensitive to the t sense of sweet, you can taste sweetness in kale. Uh, flowering kale is sweeter than mm -hmm. the kale that most people get. So your vegetables um, just have so many wonderful nutrients that are special for the brain. They got traces of vitamin E, they have traces of omega-3s, wow. which is why we eat all the fish, mm -hmm. but green leafy vegetables have omega-3s in them, plus the vitamin E and so many other uh, keratins and even the long list of different nutri okay, nutrients. Okay, so, so fish is good for you, green leafy vegetables are good for mm -hmm. you. Uh, as long as you don't overeat them, fruits are good for you. Right. Because as you said, if you right. overeat them, right. you get too much right. sugar. So, uh, th yeah. but you were talking about inflammation. Does sugar cause inflammation? Yeah. Is inflammation bad? Yeah, yeah. It, it is bad. Yeah. Inflammation is bad um, everywhere. In the, in the body when there's too much of it. Initially, it's part of the healing process. Well, mm -hmm. but uh, most of the inflammation that we're worried about it is, becomes pathological. Mm -hmm. And wherever it is in your body, it's causing damage. If it's in your brain, we think, personally, a lot of us think that the brain diseases like Alzheimer's start with first oxidative stress from not eating enough uh, antioxidants in your diet to balance what else you're eating and then that leads to inflammation and then that triggers a lot of the other pathological processes. Any inflammation will build up um, this problem A beta, uh, one of the problem proteins in Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. uh, if you fed mice just sugar water versus water and everything else was the same, the ones fed the extra, the sugar water, they will get A beta building up in their brain, they will decline uh, cognitively faster and they will get high cholesterol. And that's, that's related to studies that just came out for us humans that is actually eating too much sugar and refined carbs. That's the other category of food you want to reduce uh, or try to avoid um, will cause your body to make extra co cholesterol. It's not eating cholesterol-rich foods and saturated fats. That's brand new okay. in the last year. So what what you do you mean by refined carbohydrates? Can you define that? Yeah, they're, you're, they're mostly white. It's basically, you, you took a, a natural grain and you took off the outside, the fibrous part. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's left is uh, called a refined uh, grain or refined carb. So white rice versus brown or wild rice mm -hmm. and so on. Um, so you want to, if you're wanting to know what other foods to eat more of, whole grains. Whole grains. Whole grains. And, um, and the other is uh, lentils and beans. Mm -hmm. They're healthy across the board uh, for almost all our major diseases, great for the brain. The other would be nuts and seeds. Okay. It's, those are great sources of healthy fats along with your antioxidants. Now let me ask you about nuts. I mean, uh, mm. I've been reading a lot about, you know, people should eat walnuts and almonds and so forth and so yeah. on. However, I've also read in, in other sources that you have to be careful not to eat too much of a nut because nuts are very high in fat. Now, are they okay. good or are they not Guess good? Guess what? We're right. just learning that fat isn't our problem. Okay, all right. And as far as the brain, I mean, there may be still some studies. We do know that any kind of trans fat is really toxic for the brain, especially, mm -hmm. but also the whole body. Nuts have uh, a whole range of fats. 
they don't have any cholesterol if we were worried about that mm -hmm. um, and they've got a whole range of different healthy fats yes they're high in calories but the thing is if you eat nuts for your snack not they have fats and proteins that's what fills you up mm -hmm. it's when you are eating potato chips and cookies that are and cake that are just um, carbs they don't fill you up they don't keep you full you want to eat again in a little while so we're, we're discovering that you can probably I don't know whether you could eat too many nuts and seeds probably you could figure out a way to do that mm -hmm. but it, it tends to make you not eat the carbs that you should be avoiding right. it's a non-event that the that there's fat in nuts it turns out yes we used to worry about fat in everything right right and that's what the researchers are now concluded has gotten us into the trouble we're in okay so now you know this is a meat and potato society the US yeah. society yeah meat and potatoes are they good for you are they good are they <laughs> brain healthy foods well see in the old days our, our meat was free range and then it had omega-3s in the flesh of all our, our um, farm animals uh, it's really um, now they don't they're mostly uh, raised in with a narrow diet mm -hmm. so they're no longer healthy animals they may taste good right but they're no longer healthy animals so I, I caution people there are lots of elements in red meat actually that are dangerous for the brain I can't tell you what they all are but my neurologist research colleagues tell me mm -hmm. that and I believe them and so you want to minimize your red meat that doesn't mean eat none it's, sure. it's your favorite food just eat less yeah. um, and poultry seems to be a neutral kind of thing mm -hmm. uh, we recommend you eat fish or seafood and it's and seafood not just fish mm -hmm. uh, three times a week at least if you can eat it four or five you know sometimes dinner sometimes lunch so much the better leafy greens I recommend at least three or four or five times a week mm -hmm. and uh, there are issues with that for people with on warfarin or coumadin but if they eat an even amount of greens every day mm -hmm. that's how they can handle that um, let's see whatever the other negative food would be nitrates you want to avoid processed meats I cold see. cuts bacon ham mm -hmm. that red color tells you usually that there are nitrates and in the body and brain it acts like insulin mm -hmm. or like acts like sugar and treating and triggering insulin problems so um, and other other things it does that are negative but that's particularly important because the brain is so delicate now now I have read that the Mediterranean diet is actually very good for you physically yes but how is it in terms of brain health is it good for your brain health yeah. as well yes it's it's one of the healthier ethnic diets mm -hmm. what I would like to see because of course that one's been studied a lot by a lot of great people but the Finnish diet just is shown uh, there was a great trial in Finland with the Finnish diet physical exercise keeping socially active and mentally stimulated that showed that it helped people in their 60 to 77 at increased risk for Alzheimer's to stay uh, to improve their cognitive status compared to people on just given like written instructions what to do so so really it, it could be the Finnish national diet it could be the I think the African heritage diet is mm -hmm. terrific mm -hmm. is anyone reaching researching that no but they're looking at the Australian Aboriginal diet people in Hawaii are looking so there are probably lots of heritage diets that are terrific what's not why because they tend to emphasize whole foods mm -hmm. and they tend to emphasize mostly vegetables so that's those are keys that are across the board and I haven't mentioned spices okay spices and herbs okay tell us about spices and herbs yeah and I, I know that we we have limited time here together but spices and herbs are again a really nutrient dense food that I I really emphasize in my I have a program called the memory preservation nutrition program mm -hmm. all evidence based and um, a lot of them are they're all strong antioxidants so you don't need very much volume no calories mm -hmm and so you can eat them without worrying about adding calories and yet at the same time huge in antioxidants and many of them are strong anti-inflammatory agents everybody's heard of turmeric but there's also cinnamon and ginger okay and practically any spice that you look at has some really good properties okay and so there are even brain studies now being done to show like in humans um, one was done with sage another lemon balm another uh, saffron 
and most recently at University of Miami Allo mm. by by mouth. Okay, so oh. so there's there's actually a lot of things that we can eat that are actually very good for our brain. Yeah. You know, you're a fountain of knowledge. Would you tell our viewers if they want to get a hold of you? Oh. How to contact you? Oh, well, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, they can Google me and find me. Uh, I have a website called brainwellness.com, mm -hmm. and my phone number is actually on the website. Okay. And I'm, I'm really very accessible. And we are just coming out with, uh, we have our first recipe book. Uh, just came out in December. We're uh, doing another one we hope to have by March. And we're working on a one-week menu complete with recipes and nutrition facts and shopping lists. People want shopping lists. Okay. So there's a fountain of, you know, help out there, too. Good place for us to stop. Today, brain health has become an exciting area. That's because we're coming to the realization that as we age, maintaining brain fitness is no doubt crucial. Today, Dr. Emerson Lombardo explained that everyone can benefit from both planning and making the necessary changes to incorporate and enjoy delicious brain-healthy foods into their daily nutrition. By incorporating brain-healthy foods into your diet, you're positively affecting your cognition and brain health. However, like exercising your body, the trick is to get started and adhere to your new routine. This is where Dr. Emerson Lombardo can help you. First, she assesses your current situation. Then she assists you in setting realistic goals. And finally, she shows you, step by step, how to reach those goals. Dr. Emerson Lombardo leaves no doubt that maintaining our brain health requires a diet filled with nutritious, delicious food. In other words, good nutrition improves cognitive function, mental abilities, and may prevent or minimize age-related memory loss. Consequently, maintaining brain health is a goal to which we should all aspire. To learn more about brain health, visit brainwellness.com. And remember, when visiting brainwellness.com, you can contact Dr. Emerson Lombardo on the About Us landing page. By visiting brainwellness.com, I'm sure you'll gain a greater appreciation for the importance of improving and maintaining your brain health. In closing, I'd like to thank my guest, Dr. Nancy Emerson Lombardo, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. What fun we had. It has been a lot of yeah. fun. And as always, thank you to you, our viewers, for watching Your Money, Your Life. My name is Attorney Ramsey Barawi, building your trust. Mm -hmm.